All right. So, the title of my talk is The Hardest Thing to Get Right, How I Got It Wrong, So Horribly Wrong, and What I Learned From It, the good part. So, we'll start off with quick background, semi-illustrated primer. Growing up, I was born to uh, two hippie parents who divorced when I was two. And I had a bit of an interesting childhood. I, uh, living with my mom, we moved around a lot and got to see a lot of new places. Uh, almost every year it was a new town, a new school. Uh, this, this was great because a ton of great new experiences. The, the downside of that was that I never really got to lay down any roots or build a strong sense of community. And this is important uh, when I start talking about why I build companies the way I build them and why I think uh, values and culture are so critical and important. Uh, just flying my nerd flag here, I was a band nerd, and uh, yeah, hey, woo! And I, uh, I graduated in an international baccalaureate program, that's me on my last day of seven ridiculous AP and seven ridiculous IV exams, drinking beer in public with my dad, which was awesome. So some highlights of my, my career, uh, I started out as a paid hacker, uh, the company got bought, was uh, wasting time and, and, and boredom and, and met Sean Fanning online and, and we started working on an app together, so that's where that came from. Uh, that was a wild and crazy experience. There's books, there's movies, you should watch them, they're pretty interesting. Uh, went on to do CloudMark, anti-spam, turned into messaging security, much broader solution. Uh, went back to music, gave music a second shot, uh, this time from the inside, so I became a, literally a record label uh, executive and uh, built a sweet incubator inside of one of the world's oldest record labels in the world. Uh, went on to found Crowd, uh, Cloud Crowd, which is a crowdsourcing company, and this is gonna be really the, the topic of what I'm gonna talk about uh, and, and where I got the hardest thing to get right, where I got that wrong. Uh, and then now I'm doing IV software, since you guys just heard about it, it's Innovation Studio. So, without further ado, a uh, little bit more, a uh, few little fun tidbits about me. Uh, I do a ton of open source stuff. In addition to being a nerd, I am a geek. I love the program. Uh, I was once nominated Software Designer of the Year by the Wired Rave Awards, and I lost to Steve Jobs. So I feel pretty good about that. Bumping elbows with good people. I was once interviewed in Playboy Magazine, and I taught a class at Harvard. It was a pearl class. Okay, so a brief story about that one time. I swear it was only once. A little bit of backstory. So before I started Servio, I, I finally took my first time off. I've got a long career and I've been doing a lot of stuff and I've never really taken time off before. And so I was thinking about what was next and I heard, uh, I just got a random reach out from a prior investor uh, in uh, Cloudmark actually. And he's like, hey, we should grab, grab drinks. When I had drinks with him, I went to my favorite bar in San Francisco. It's called The Bitter End. A little bit of foreshadowing there that I didn't realize at the time. Uh, but great beer, Fifth and Clement. Uh, and we sat down and we started talking about crowdsourcing. And I, it was just so obvious to me. It was 2009, uh, economic downturn, right? People are looking for work. Uh, let's bring, there's, there's 500 million people wasting 2 billion minutes a day on Facebook back then, clicking on pictures of cats and complaining about their, their partners online. So why not bring the work to the worker and put it right in front of them and, and have them click through it? And, and who wouldn't make an extra 100 bucks on the side back then or even now? So. It was great, because he was an investor, he was like, hey, I want to run the P&L, and I wanted to build the tech and the product. So I thought, that sounds perfect, right? Well, a little bit more backstory kind of set the stage for how I made my mistake, which is, is on the hardest thing to get right. Um, this person, uh, when they made their investment, put about a million five in the cloud mark, they uh, wanted to get back into startups themselves, so they joined the company, and you know, we were fine, it was great. This person had uh, product management experience. And, but it didn't really work out that well. It was a, a bit of a culture mismatch. Uh, and in short order, we ended up parting ways with this person and they left the company. The company's gone on to thrive and flourish today. It's about 120 people doing 45 million revenues. I'm very proud of that company. Uh, but that should have been something in my mind. Uh, and I felt, you know, I felt like I'm gonna judge this person. I think they, they, they had a bad impact on my great team and, and I didn't want to uh, deal with that again. But when I had drinks with this person, seven years later, I had grown up, I had matured a little bit, uh, I thought to myself, well, let's see, you know, see, we all grow, we all change, we all mature in life. Uh, and I realized I'd made one big mistake. This guy was actually a bit of an Asperger's guy and I never really realized that before. And those are my kin, that's where I came from. So I felt really guilty 
But I had misjudged this person in the worst way when in re reality they were one of my people. And so in that moment, because I was so excited about the business and the technology and the business opportunity, uh, I said, you know what, I'm gonna give you a second chance. I'm not, I'm not gonna do the diligence that I usually do. Uh, and that set me up at the very beginning for making uh, the worst mistake. So what happened? What happened? Well, there's a lot of stuff that happened, but I'm gonna quantify it in terms of, of the, the impact. So at its fundamental root, the problem was this person believed in a different set of things than I believed in. We both thought that the business was great. We both thought that uh, there was a lot of market opportunity. We both thought uh, this, was, this was the right technological approach, but those are all very cognitive-oriented things. None of those really speak to what's down here, which is what's important to you as a person, what's important to you when you're working with people together. Uh, it's a super stressful experience. Uh, that is the thing that comes out as the most important. So that led to a dysfunctional culture. On one side, there was his point of view, and on the other, there was mine. And I was building the team and building that culture. Um, but all culture derives from the person at the top. And it's, just a, it's just a rule. I observe it over and over and over again. It doesn't matter if you're a founder. It doesn't matter if you're on the culture committee. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're another executive in the company. If you're not the CEO, then everybody's still looking at the CEO, and they're going to follow their pace and their approach. So that was kind of one of my mistakes, is I had built a great team, but uh, uh, there was this constant disconnect between what people saw and what people heard. So I would say, here's how we, how we fight, here's how we work together, here's how we hold up each other, uh, and then the leader of the company had a different set of values that they followed. So that created an atmosphere of fear and mistrust, and I think we've all seen that at some level, when there's some discontinuity or disparity between what we hear and what we see, uh, that's a big challenge. Uh, and that went both ways. Went both ways. So as, as this person was observing that, um, I think uh, they got very nervous and anxious and scared as well. And that led to uh, a homogenous board, truly a homogenous board, where there was, there was really no way to uh, incentivize this person to change or adapt or, or take a different approach. So the imbalance of power at the board level is something I've seen twice now in companies that I've built. Um, you know, it, it's great if you have a limited number of people that you have to convince and, and lobby, but there is truly a value in, in a diversity of opinion and perspective. So overall, the biggest impact of all this, getting this culture bit wrong up front, was we tragically missed a much, much bigger opportunity. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is in just a second. So first, the logic of not accepting defeat, or why I stuck with a bad partnership. Philosophical, right? The, the the experience of an entrepreneur is chaos, and it's and it's a struggle, and you have to be able to endure that experience, and more importantly, in, in some frames, you have to be stubborn about enduring in that experience. And there were all these great practical reasons on the other side of it. I had built this amazing team uh, who were basically the battle hardened. A group of software warriors who had been in constant adversity as we were building up this company in the economic downturn. Uh, and we had great tech. I mean, honestly, it was one of the most sophisticated systems that I'd ever laid hands on. And this team and I built this thing together. Very proud of that accomplishment. And then there was the business. Uh, we, we, in, our, in our second year, we did a million in, in revenue. We did four and a half million in the second and third year. And we were projecting 11 million. That's the graph that we all love to see. Uh, and there were so all these logical reasons in my head not to leave, to endure, but, but for this fundamental thing. But then came the decision to accept defeat. So this is the true chaos of being an entrepreneur, is, is there are demons and paradise both at the gate. They all await us. And every day, day in and day out, things could shift, things could swing wildly in either direction. And so... I had basically gotten to a point, though, in the business, despite all these wonderful reasons to keep pushing it forward, to, uh, I, I'd gotten to a point where my co-founder and I could not exist in the business anymore, together. And that was really tough for me, because I felt a tremendous amount of loyalty to my team. You know, a lot of these people came to work with me and, and built this thing with, together with us. And uh, I just, I, I felt guilt and shame uh, and self-judgment about abandoning this thing that I had led and put forth and really struggled with together. And I said, everybody, you know, stick with it. How could I turn my back on that? Uh, but then I got, to, I got to a really important point, and I think hopefully this is one of the points uh, of, of 
reflection and lessons that'll help you guys is I wasn't happy. I look back at all the things that I've done. I they were challenging. It was crazy and, and wondrous and amazing and terrible and depressing, but I was happy. And I was not happy in this particular experience. And I got to the point where I said, you know, I just deserve to be happy. I've been suffering, and I deserve to be happy. So this forms the, uh, the anchor for the lesson that we're going to talk about. So now the learnings. Typical problems I'm, I'm accustomed to. Will the tech work? Oh my God, we see this problem. Can we make the tech do it? Right? In the CloudMark days, that was applying machine learning tech before anyone was doing it commercially to the NSFAN problem. And uh, you know, we had some inkling that it would work, but we didn't had, had it proven yet. Uh, so that's a big problem. Uh, will anyone use the product? Okay, we solved that problem, but maybe it's so insanely unusable that no one actually wants to install it or deploy it. Uh, so that's a big challenge. Uh, and will anyone pay for the product? So you got those first two problems solved, but why do you want, can I actually build a business around this, right? Those are like the three common, most common problems that you have in a startup. But do I have the right people? It actually belongs at the top of the list in front of these three things. And what does it mean if I don't, right? How do things go wrong and why, why is, as so many other people uh, earlier today have, have alluded to, why is culture actually the most important thing? And in fact, what I got wrong in this one case. So a little bit about startups. We all know their pressure, high pressure, high stress. I call them diamond making machines. We back up dump truck after dump truck after dump truck with coal, and that's you all, that's us. And we grind it up under high pressure into fine, fine dust, that's us. Uh, and maybe, maybe just maybe, a diamond pops out the other side of it. That's what startups are like. It's this incredible experience, but it is, it is very, very difficult on us. They're also like marriages. Marriages require great communication skills. And the best way to establish that is to have uh, a, a common culture, a common shared set of values, a common set of beliefs that unite us and bind us together. And as well, marriages require uh, trust and respect for each other. And again, it's really hard to have that if we're really thinking about it as a job and not as a community or a team or family or a culture. Um, and last thing that starts are like marriages, because a great startup is a very intimate experience, right? It has an intimate, personal feel with the people that you struggle with, that you triumph with, and that you despair with on a daily basis. And startups are like emotional roller coasters. Now, I know this point's been made a thousand times. I want to, I want to modify something Mark Barrow said in a prior GeekWire talk. He said, he made, I think, exactly the same point. They're like roller coasters. But I want to add to that. They're like roller coasters, riding a roller coaster while you're building it. It's a whole new level of insanity because you're always stepping out. If, you, if you're going after a hard problem that's not solved, that, that has a challenging business model, it's always like stepping out onto this crazy experience. And by the way, startups being so crazy are edge level experiences. They, they almost exclusively live, at least the early stage parts, they live at the edge of felt experience. They're wondrous and amazing and wonderful and depressing and sad and terrible and exhilarating and exuberant and, and just depressing, right? It's a thing that lives on the edges and we have to appreciate what that means and more importantly, what binds us together, what keeps us together while we're being ground into dust. <laughs> so, you will suffer. And boy, does it suck to suffer alone. This is the thing that makes us compromise, right? Said, oh, if only I could find someone who helped me raise money, or find talent, or engineer the product. If only I could find someone to run operations, or do marketing, right? That's the thing that causes us to compromise. But, it is better to suffer alone than to suffer with fools. So how many times have you been frustrated by mediocrity? Today, yesterday, the day before? My personal pet peeve are digital interfaces and physical interfaces. There's a dozen things on a daily basis that really frustrate the hell out of me. And, and I can see ways that it should be done better, and that's kind of the, the, mode, the, the mode for me when I'm doing startups. It's like there is this big problem, it's a personal problem for me, how do I solve that problem, how do we solve it for more people? Uh, but it's better to suffer alone than it is to suffer with fools. You're going to suffer no matter what. Uh, but you at least, so, so the way I take 
the way I look at it is I took responsibility, I generally take responsibility for that experience. And I do the only thing that I can do that uh, I have control over, which is to do it all myself. And I think that's a controversial point for some people. I know in the business community, in the, in the more mature business communities, uh, there's a statement about, you know, you can't do it all yourself, and you have to learn how to scale, and you have to learn where to pick your battles. But I say to you, how do you know what the job takes? Whether you're a, 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 a staff person, a manager, or an entrepreneur, or an owner, how do you know how to evaluate and assess properly if you've never done before? And so I would suggest that if you can surrender to that and do it yourself at least once, everything, you actually find yourself being a lot more self-sufficient and reliable, uh, self-reliant, and you won't feel so compelled to compromise. And you're looking for those things that we all need. But with the right people, you will suffer happily. And so that, that was kind of the, the, the epiphany that I came to uh, while doing Servio was I was suffering, and suffering's part and parcel for what early stage startups are all about. But if you have the right people and you're bound together in the right, way, right ways, it doesn't matter what the challenges are, right? If you, if you are deeply connected with your, the person you're in a marriage with, then you can get through anything. And that is truly the fundamental frame for me when it comes to building great startups. So, a little bit of, a little detour on advice. How? All right, that was a great piece of knowledge, but how do you do that? And I think that this is easily something that could, I, I could fill another hour with talking about what my approach is to finding the right people and assessing values, but I'm gonna give you a quick hint. I'm gonna give you a quick little summary of, of the way I approach it. So, I think of it as the three C's. Culture, capacity, and craft. Now, earlier today you heard about some people talk about how they interview or how to evaluate and assess people. And, we, and I think that the typical approach, I was guilty of this in the beginning as well, is we think of that job description, right? Okay, here's the role, and it's got these buckets. It needs to have this, it needs to have this, it needs to have this. This is a nice to have, this is a nice to have, this is a need to have. And then here's the candidate. And we start computing check boxes. Do they have it? Do they have it? No, yes, no, no, no. It's expensive, it's time consuming. And it has nothing to do with culture. Right? We spend all this time up front thinking about that, and it's an expensive, time-consuming exercise, and we don't think about culture, which is the most important thing for building an enduring team. Right? And it's different for everybody, right? So there's no, here's the grading sheet for culture. You, know, you have to develop that on your own, but in short, always interview for values first. Always, always, always. And that is a thing you can feel. Once you understand what, you, what matters to you and, and what's important in the context of the business you're trying to build, you're, you're participating in with someone else, it's really easy to feel that. You can feel it in the first 60 seconds, you can feel it in the first five minutes. You may not even know how to articulate, but if you, if you practice elevating that to the level of conscious awareness, it's a very powerful thing and you can filter through potential candidates a lot faster without needing any new intelligence or any new thing because this thing is super smart. A lot of ways it's a lot more smart than this. Second, second bit of advice, in an early stage startup, everything you do is new. Oh, well, I mean, it should be. Otherwise, you're just need to be. But uh, by default, your ability to learn new things, to adapt, to experiment, the most important skill is your capacity for mastery, your, your skill in learning other skills. Right? Again, we think of it as a job description. Here's the role, and here's, here's the matrix of stuff, and we're going to match it for that candidate. And, and, and even then, on that list, is not, how do I measure potential? How do I measure, um, you know, how well will they do in this highly nimble, high, highly agile environment? So we're very deliberate. I'm very deliberate. My team's very deliberate in the three C's. And that number, set, and that number two, uh, really focusing on what is their capacity to master new things. I'll give you a quick anecdote. Uh, sometimes it has nothing to do with the job. I first learned this thing back in my CloudMark days. I was hiring uh, a particular senior level engineer. He got gotten through about three hours of interviews. I was his last interview, and it wasn't, wasn't like, no, he was good, he was all right. It wasn't exceptional. And I, and I had like 15 minutes left in the, in the tail end of the interview, just to, just to time to kill. So I said, so what else are you, what are you, what else are you into? And he's like, let me tell you about brewing beer. And then he launched. 
he launched into this thing that he built in his, in his garage, and he said, said, you know, if you use hops at this point, and you add this at this point, if you let it sit for another two hours, normally they say, do it for one hour, and if you leave it bottled in this rough, like he just went off. I can't even regurgitate all of that stuff. But I knew in that moment, wow, this guy has mastered something. It doesn't matter, actually, where I, where I assess his skills at, because clearly, if he's passionate and excited and interested, and he describes the value system, yeah, he will learn something new, and there's a lot of potential in that person. And he is still there today. He, he was a startup guy, and he's been there for 11 years now. So super proud of that. And that, that was a super, very important thing for me. So skills are still important. I call that craft. But I would, I would offer this piece of advice. Um, we all talk about problem-solving skills. Here's a logic problem. Here's a this problem. You know, do you, have you ever seen this pattern before? Do you know this algorithm? And I would argue that critical thinking skills are a lot more valuable than problem-solving skills. I think maybe some people would argue they're the same, but I see them as very different. To me, critical thinking skills are about your ability to deconstruct, to observe, to be aware, to, to identify what the variables are before you try and solve for them. Which, to me, the latter part is what problem-solving is. So, when, I'm, when we are evaluating the three C's on the craft side, which comes third, right, after we've done that really quick gut check and we have established that they have some capacity, some potential for mastery, uh, then we look for really great critical thinking skills. And that, that looks like having people explain to you their thought process. And again, it may have nothing to do with, with coding or whatever the job is. So it's a lot more broad. So in conclusion, the hardest thing to get is people. Value is culture, right? That is the thing that binds us all together. And if you can make peace with doing it all by yourself, you're not going to be as compromised, right? And, and that, that, that isn't just a piece of advice for, for would-be entrepreneurs. It's, it's, it's advice for everybody, right? You've got to understand what it takes. And once you do, you can actually feel really confident in locating that capacity and capability in other people. But you've got to surrender to that and make your peace with it once, at least once. But not forever, because that is definitely not scalable. Define your values early and stay true to them. Uh, so I, in my experience, there's a lot of companies out there that, that, do actual, that don't define their values. Uh, there are a, a smaller set of, of companies that do define values, um, but no one can tell you how to apply them, necessarily. So they might be great things to be defined towards, but how do you represent those things? How do you stay true to your values? Right? We look for opportunities to call them out in everything that we do on a daily basis. My company just shipped a new version of its website today. It was biased towards action. It was craftsmanship. These are two of our values. There's a lot more. And we look for opportunities to reinforce that in everything that we do. We put them up on a wall. We call them out. We, we praise and we critique each other in terms of those values. And that's how we stay true to them. It's a bit of advice for you. And the, and, and the third part is you should master how to evaluate them in others. We've, we've been practicing mastering evaluation of skills for so long, and it's a hard thing to deprogram, or it's even just a harder thing to adapt and, and add to. But if you, if you focus on what the values are, if you focus on what that feels like, and you use feeling language and feeling process to establish that it's a good connection, that energetic exchange, that, that data point is one of the most fundamental data points to know how well a person works with an existing team and whether that will endure or not. Maybe able to hire the role according to skill sets, but will that person be here in a year? Will they be here in two years when the shit might hit the fan or when you know, there's an opportunity to do something better? And it's what we all believe in that binds us together through the hard times. And the last bit is suffer happily or don't suffer. Make a different choice for yourself. I know that's oversimplified, but it really can be that easy if you can arrive at that point and say, you know what, I'm just not getting what I need out of this. And I deserve to be happy. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening.